Today, there was a Jewish population there on a particular island called Jerba. It's interesting, he's talking about how Zedekiah had another son, a son named Mulek. I was actually part of an expedition that left from there on a ship called Phoenicia. I just want to point out, there's no way Joseph Smith is making this random guess. This week, we're taking the stick of Joseph on an airplane all the way across the country. Where are we going? Wait, why are we going? You're gonna have to stick around to find out. Hey guys, I just wanna let you know about the Firm Foundation Book of Mormon Evidences Conference that's coming Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I'm gonna be speaking Friday at 7 p.m. and I would love to meet all of you, whether at that speech or I will be hanging out there most of the day on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I'll be with Dave Butler as well and Mike Day, if you know who they are from some of our past videos. We'd love to see you there, so check it out. Go to the website or you can uh, just show up and get a ticket there. We just got here to our hotel in Washington, D.C. And this might sound a little silly to you guys, but we still really don't understand why we're here. <laughs> At all. <laughs> um, we got this fancy little invitation in the mail, and I'll just read it for you. Okay, it says, do. the ambassador of the Republic of Tunisia to the United States of America, Her Excellency, Hanin Tajouri Basasi, requests the pleasure of your company, Hayden, at the reception, connecting the ancient people of Tunisia with the ancient people of America and shedding light on the greatness of the Carthaginian Empire and the Phoenicians. Yeah, the Carthaginians. Now you probably that. understand how we don't really know we how have this no connects idea with the going on, Mormon. But they are having a meeting downstairs, and apparently they're gonna kinda tell us a little bit more about this, so we should probably head there and we see what we can so. find out. <laughs> we got to the meeting late, but as we listened, we kept hearing talk about Mulek, a boat, some guy named Philip, Tunisia, and an island named Gerbil or something. Luckily, there were some familiar faces there with Rod Meldrum and Boy Tuttle, so we thought it'd be good to sit down with them and try to piece together what's going on. Hayden and I right now are in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C., supposedly because there's an event that's connected with the Book of Mormon. Okay, but here's our question. We're confused. What does the Republic of Tunisia have to do with the Book of Mormon? Well, my biggest question is, how did you guys get an invite? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, are, we are really grateful to have you guys come and, and, and share some of this information to hear. And uh, so the question is, is about Tunisia, right? Yeah. First off, where is Tunisia? Please explain. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it, offense. It's basically my northern Jones, Africa. Yeah. Part of this has to do with Lehi's dream. He warned the people, if they don't repent, that, they, that they're going to be destroyed, right? Mm -hmm. I think some people actually took some of that to heart and actually did leave, but where did they go? Okay, so that, that brings us into, we have to cover a couple quick things. Who are the Phoenicians? Where is Phoenicia? And then how does that all fit in with Tunisia? Okay, so the Phoenicians were basically the, one of the greatest seafaring people in the world. They had uh, massive armadas. They, they, they traveled all throughout the Mediterranean, they had over 300 ports that they traveled through in this area. One of the biggest ports actually was this place called Carthage. Mm -hmm. um, which is in Tunisia. And it turns out that there today, there was a Jewish population there on a particular island called Jerba. And, and Boyd's going to talk about that in just yeah. a little bit. But, uh, but a lot of these people escaping prior to the conquest of the Babylonians actually left there and they went over to Africa. I want you to talk about this island because he, he talked about how there's evidence of this Jewish population that escaped 600 BC. And the island, what is it, Gerbil? Gerba. Gerba, not Gerbil. Not Gerbil. The, the <laughs> island is called Gerba, and it actually starts with a D. I was actually part of an expedition that left from there on a ship called Phoenicia. And, but while there, doing study and research on that, we learned about this amazing historical fact that's little known, actually. But what happened is they have a long-standing history at this island of Gerba in a synagogue. And the synagogue is famous because it's the longest uh, continuously operating synagogue in the world, starting at that time, 600, roughly 600 BC until today. All right, let's take a break. Let's review a little bit about what we've been learning. 
because this is a lot. So as Rod pointed out, around 600 BC, we hear about Lehi leaving Jerusalem. Now, the, the clue that we get to this is actually found in the fourth verse of the first chapter, and it says this, For it came to pass in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, my father Lehi, having dwelt in Jerusalem all his days. So we know Zedekiah is somewhere around 600 BC. Uh, scholars will say anything from 597, 596, but there is discrepancy in old calendars because believe it or not, not everything was standardized 2,600 years ago. So 597-ish, 600 BC is where Lehi starts getting his visions. Soon after, he leaves just Jerusalem and prophesies that it's going to be destroyed. And then we know historically that it was destroyed around 586 BC. And that's what brings in that Tunisian island of Jerba. Now, I looked some things up about that synagogue, found some pictures. Now, the synagogue that's standing there today isn't the original one, but they say it's built in the same place that the old one was built. But the cool claim is, is that they say that inside of that synagogue is actually a piece of King Solomon's temple's door, as well as a stone from the temple when the Babylonians destroyed it. So that's a pretty cool claim, but they say it's hidden away in the synagogue and only like the, the leaders can see it. So who knows whether or not it's actually there. But the historical claim is that the people that escaped Jerusalem uh, during its destruction ended up on this little island and that Jewish population still exists. They've even done DNA research uh, that suggests that these people do come from the Middle East as opposed to Northern Africa, which is pretty cool. But then then begs the question, how did they get all the way from Jerusalem to this Tunisian island of Jerba? And that's where the Phoenicians come in, okay? So the Phoenicians, they had these big port cities. They traveled all around the Mediterranean. But why don't we hear about them in the Bible? Well, Boyd actually addressed this question. This is what he had to say about it. We often hear Phoenicians, but we read in the Bible. We don't ever read about Phoenicians. No, we don't read about them. That's because they're not called Phoenicians until much later. The Greeks named them Phoenicians, okay? And that's much later. Okay. But they're actually the Canaanites. It's just be known as the Canaanites. And so, okay. and, and when we speak to Tunisians, they'll say Canaan. That yes. Those from Canaan. So the Phoenicians didn't have like a capital city, but among the three most dominant cities of the Phoenician Empire at that time was Sidon, which sounds familiar and we're going to get into later because that plays a role in the Book of Mormon, uh, a place called Byblos I, I or Byblos, I don't know how they say it, as well as a place called Tyre. So one school of thought suggests that the people who escaped from Jerusalem went north to the city Tyre, which was like uh, the, the closest large Phoenician port. And there they hopped on a ship, sailed through the Mediterranean until they got to the island of Jerbal uh, in what is modern day Tunisia. Right next to Jerbal is another Phoenician port called Carthage. And that was another dominant city in the Mediterranean. All right, so here's the summary, but what does this have to do with the Book of Mormon? Well, some of you listening might have had a couple bells go off as I was talking, because the Book of Mormon doesn't just talk about one group of people that escaped the destruction of Jerusalem, but it talks about two people. And it also mentions someone named Zedekiah, who we talked about earlier. The first time in the Book of Mormon that we learn about this other group of people that escaped Jerusalem before its destruction is in Omni chapter 1, verse 16 or 15 and 16, it says, Behold, it came to pass that Messiah discovered that the people of Zarahemla, so this, this new group that they found, came out from Jerusalem at the time that Zedekiah, king of Judah, was carried away captive into Babylon. And they journeyed in the wilderness and were brought by the hand of the Lord across the great waters. So once again, we hear that name Zedekiah. This time, it's about Zedekiah um, being carried captive into Babylon when the Babylonians sieged the city. Now, Rod Meldrum told us a little bit about what happened to Zedekiah, as we find in the Old Testament, when he was taken back to Babylon. The Babylonians did come in. Um, king Zedekiah was the king of the time in the southern part of Israel. And they sacked Jerusalem, they took down the temple, and they hauled a lot of those people back as slaves back to Babylon. Okay. A couple of things about Zedekiah, because you may not already know this. But uh, they, they gathered all of his sons, his, his posterity, his, his uh, male posterity, brought it before him, okay. killed his sons in front of him, Holy and then cow. put his eyes out so the last thing he would ever see in this life is his sons dying. Holy shnikes. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar was a wicked dude. These were hard times, man. Yeah, <laughs> they, were goodness, they did not mess around. Man, that's some gruesome stuff. 
One thing to know is that in 2 Kings 25, 7, it does not explicitly say that he killed all of the sons of Zedekiah. It says that he killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and then put out, put out his eyes. Now, this is really interesting to know because in the Book of Mormon, later on, you have Nephi, the son of Helaman, talking about this group of people that were in Zarahemla that we talked about earlier that had escaped at the time of Zedekiah. And he has this to say. He says, and now will you dispute that Jerusalem was destroyed? Will ye say that the sons of Zedekiah were not slain, all except it were Mulek? Yea, and do ye not behold that the seed of Zedekiah are with us, and they were driven out of the land of Jerusalem? It's interesting, he's talking about how Zedekiah had another son, a son named Mulek. Now that group in Zarahemla that we talked about earlier, their name was the Mulekites. They called themselves the Mulekites. So this is kind of a crazy claim. The Bible simply just says that the sons of Zedekiah were killed before him, but it doesn't talk about any sons that escaped. But the Book of Mormon here is saying that one of those sons did escape and that he was brought across the ocean to the Americas, just like Lehi was. Okay, well, is there any evidence of this extra son named Mulek in the Bible. Now there's actually two really interesting theories that we're gonna explore in this video. The first one we learned while we were there and another one we've, we, we learned as we did more research into it. And they're both, they're both very probable as far as I see. So let's listen to the first one presented by Boyd and Rod. The, uh, there, there's been several different ideas that have been uh, proposed that possibly it is, number one, we know it was fairly regular practice for kings back in those days to have more than one wife. So uh, it's possible that Zedekiah may have been married to another woman and that, and that the idea is basically because Mulek means little king. Okay. Okay. That's like the origin breakdown or like the Hebrew breakdown or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Little king. It means li little king. And, uh, and it's possible that the reason why he didn't get taken with the other sons of Zedekiah is because he may have been in vitro at the time. And, and so they, it's interesting to note that <coughs> Zedekiah at the time um, even though the pictures of him will show an old man, he was 31. Mm. So his children, his sons, were not mature mm. men. Right? Oh my it, gosh, so Nebuchadnezzar was a real sicko. Yeah. yeah, and so <laughs> so his youngest child, obviously, you know, was very young, maybe not even born yet. That's kind of my own view. Because yeah. had he been born, this is what I believe, first of all, the Babylonians were very efficient at severing any chance of claiming the throne, right? Okay. And that's yeah. what they feared the most, is that someone would rise up and say, I have a rightful heir to the throne, and they didn't want that to happen. So they would hunt down and track down, and that's why they blinded him after the killing of his son, so that he could bear witness. Then they carried him back to Babylon, where he would bear witness until his mm -hmm. dying day, that, yeah, there I have no heirs. Yeah. That's why I think, had he been born, it would have been a matter of record. I mean, the king's son, the king's wife has sure. a child. That's a that's a, a potential prince of Judah. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking he wasn't born, or or at least his, if he was, he wasn't there. And just the fact that his name that his name is Little King, because that's what they would have called. Like the second he was born, like this is the heir to the throne. This is the Little King. But he had to be protected. Man, Joseph and, Smith and, and was so good they, at making this stuff They couldn't this stay up. there, so they had to go someplace where they were going to have some protection. <laughs> okay, so now this next one is really interesting. And as I was like getting ready to prepare to explain this, I found a video from uh, Book of Mormon Central that does such a good job at describing this theory that I'm actually just going to put it in here. And let's watch it real quick because it explains the second theory from where the name Mulek comes from. The Book of Mormon claims that King Zedekiah had a son named Mulek, who somehow escaped execution when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem in 587 BC. Mulek then sailed to the Americas, where his descendants eventually merged with the Nephites. Yet if Zedekiah actually had a son named Mulek, you might wonder why he's never met. Hey, Heartlanders, just chill out for a second, okay? They think it happened in Mesoamerica. It doesn't really matter when it comes to Mulek, okay? So just listen without freaking out, all right? <laughs> mentioned in the Bible. Or is he? Some scholars have proposed that Mulek may be a shortened form of the name Malchiah, which does show up in the Bible. This would be like the biblical name Baruch, which is short for Berechiah. It could also be compared to the English name Mike, which is short for Michael. When names were written out in ancient Hebrew, the vowels weren't included, so Mulek and Malchiah would actually look like this. And then if Malchiah's ending were dropped, which was fairly common for this type of name element, it would be spelled just like Mulek. As one scholar puts it, the MLK basis of both Hebrew names is clear. 
There's more to the evidence, though. Not only does the name Malchiah show up in the Bible, but it does so in a way that directly invites a connection with Mulek from the Book of Mormon. In the Bible, we learn that the prophet Jeremiah was cast into the dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamelech. The King James translation makes it seem like Hamelech is the name of a man, but it's actually just the Hebrew term for the king, which is why many modern translations render it as Malchiah, the king's son. But who was this king? We can be confident that it was Zedekiah himself, who is mentioned in the preceding verse and is the only king named throughout this chapter. In simple English, it's as if the Bible is claiming Zedekiah had a son named Michael and the Book of Mormon is claiming he had a son named Mike, except the actual names are Malchiah and Mulek. Yet this connection would only be apparent to someone familiar with ancient Hebrew, which Joseph Smith wasn't in 1829. One might still wonder, though, whether the Malchiah mentioned in the Bible ever really existed. Here's where an ancient artifact comes in handy. In the 1980s, a small clay stamp seal dating to the late 7th to early 6th centuries BC was discovered in Jerusalem. It bears the name Malkiyahu ben Hamelech. Malkiyahu is just a variant spelling of Malkiah, and ben Hamelech simply means son of the king. In <laughs> other words, cool. the name on the stamp seal matches up well with Malkiah, son of the king from the Book of Jeremiah, which matches up well with Mulek, son of King Zedekiah from the Book of Mormon. As one scholar concluded, it appears that the seal of Mulek has been found. While the connection can't be proven definitively, it lends ample support for the Book of Mormon's claims about Mulek as well as Joseph Smith's prophetic calling. That's the evidence. You decide. So either one of those theories is cool. I do think that the the Zedekiah's son being in utero or very, very young and escaping with a mother is probably more likely, specifically because Zedekiah was so young and the fact that they that Mulek means little king. I think that's I think it's kind of cool. Maybe, maybe that's just me. It's just a little bit more dramatic, you know, that she's pregnant, she escapes, and then later they give birth and they're like, this is the king's son. I don't know, it's a cool movie. But either one of those I think are very compelling. And I just want to point out, there's no way Joseph Smith is making this random guess. Those who just give a naturalistic explanation for the Book of Mormon. So a guy who doesn't speak a lick of Hebrew just comes up with a name that happens to mean little king in Hebrew and corresponds to both the story of the fact that it's Zedekiah's son and also the fact that in the Old Testament it has Malchiah, which could very much mean Mulek, or Mulek could be the shortened version of that. That's just crazy to believe that. I think it's a very strong evidence that the Book of Mormon really is an ancient document. But let's keep moving on because here's the thing. Even if all of this language stuff is true, and even these little historical nuggets in Northern Africa, were they even able to sail across to the Americas at that time? Yes, the Phoenicians are able to sail around in the Mediterranean, but the Atlantic Ocean is a lot bigger and a lot rougher than the Mediterranean. And that's the next question we get into. All right, guys, we're going to be doing the part two here soon, where we actually talk with someone who sailed in a 600 BC ship across the Atlantic and actually proved both of the voyages of the Book of Mormon are possible. Plus, we make it to the Tunisian embassy and learn some cool stuff.